You're listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host Garland Nixon. And let me just, so you all don't think we're not <laughs> respecting you, the the laughter is tied to this next story because I told Garland well, for 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 Netanyahu to decide not to come to Washington. Uh, he's acting like a petulant child. And, and if that were me and my father, I would have been put out the house if I had taken that kind of position. Uh, Israel cancels Washington visit after U.S. allows U.N. Gaza ceasefire resolution to pass. Tensions between the U.S. and Israel were exposed earlier today when Washington stood aside and allowed the U.N. Security Council to pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. For insight into this, let's turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's chair of history and African-American studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest books include, I Dare Say, a Gerald Horn reader and acknowledging radical histories. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. The U.S. decision to abstain on the vote prompted Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu to cancel a scheduled trip to the U.S. by two of his top advisors. Uh, Dr. Horn, who who told Linda Thomas-Greenfield to put her hand down? Dr. Gerald Horn. Well, clearly Israel and the United States are in desperate need of a marriage therapist. Can this relationship be saved is the question on the table. And the answer is not as obvious as it may have seemed before October 7, 2023. Uh, You may have noticed that the prominent uh, Israeli analyst who teaches in the UK, Elon Poppy, has said that we are at the beginning of the end of the entire Zionist project in the foothills indeed. And certainly Mr. Biden and his team have to be concerned about the noncommittal votes in the Michigan primary and other jurisdictions, the fact that the United Auto Workers, amongst other mass organizations, have come out for a ceasefire, the AME Church, the prominent African Methodist Episcopal Church has done likewise. That's not to even mention the organizations in the Jewish community, such as Jewish Voices for Peace, if not now, J Street, the prominent lobbying organization in your own district of Columbia. And you may have noticed the two-page article spread in this Sunday's New York Times by the former editor of the New Republic, also headquartered in the district. I'm speaking of Peter Biden, who is also a prominent journalist, who reports in depth on the rifts and division, not only in the Zionist community, but in the Jewish community writ large. With regard to the former, i.e. the Zionist community, it's apparent that they're shifting to the right That is to say that they're becoming ever closer to the Republican Party. Recall that just a day or two ago, uh, Mr. Netanyahu addressed a caucus of the Republicans in Congress. Uh, This was preceded, you may recall, a few years ago by his coming to Washington, not at the behest of the Obama administration then in power, but at the behest of Republicans in order to address them and other uh, supporters uh, in the halls of Congress. And what's happening is that this is also shifting to a political discourse that's to the detriment of a goodly number of the Democratic Party base. I'm referring to this rather diabolical scheme to draw an equivalence between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism or anti-Jewish fervor. In fact, according to the Washington Post, even Facebook has been contemplating this sort of devious maneuver, uh, which will obviously uh, be uh, contrary to traditional interpretations of freedom of speech and the First Amendment. And then you see prominent Zionist billionaires like Bill Ackman of Pershing Capital, who led the charge against the first black president of Harvard, first black woman president, speaking of the woman of Haitian descent, uh, Claudine Gay, uh, who was driven from office just a few months ago 
because of her lack of enthusiasm about genocide in Gaza. That suggests that that particular spigot of cash coming from the likes of Mr. Ackman for the Democratic Party may be drying up uh, to the benefit of the Republican Party. And at a certain point, the Democrats, and I guess Linda Thomas-Greenfield also, have to ask themselves, are we just chumps? That is to say, uh, despite uh, Netanyahu and the Likud and the ultra-Orthodox ultra of jumping in bed all together with the Republicans, and yet the Democrats are still expected to carry water uh, for Netanyahu, even though they are engaged in maneuvers that are eroding and attacking the Democratic Party base. Then there are, there is the collateral damage of this growing rift between the White House and Mr. Netanyahu. I'm speaking of an impending uh, black Jewish rift, that is to say the fact that the Zionist lobby is going after members of the Congressional Black Caucus deemed to be insufficiently enthusiastic about genocide, particularly Cori Bush of St. Louis and Andre Carson, a Muslim of Indiana. Uh, you see that there's also a rift in the black leadership with those aforementioned members of Congress and a standoff with the New York City-based leadership, speaking of speaker-in-waiting Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Congressman Gregory Meeks of Southeast Queens, ranking Democrat on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, who has been a militant with regard to neoconservative policies around the world, not least in Southern Africa and Taiwan, and of course, the mayor Eric Adams and Reverend Al Sharpton as well, who, by the way, might be out on a limb because to a certain extent, their policies as of yesterday are at odds with the policy of the Biden White House and Linda Thomas Greenfield today. And politicians do not like to be exposed in such a naked manner. It's also apparent that Israel's recalcitrance with regard to this genocide is complicating the global position of U.S. imperialism at a time when it cannot afford that kind of debacle, uh, speaking of his standoff with both Russia and China. And now I'm referring to the fact that relations with South Africa have taken a downturn in light of South Africa dragging Israel before the International Court of Justice at The Hague on charges of genocide against Israel and Gaza, with the United States being an implicit, if not explicit, aider and a, a better. I'm speaking of the fact that both Brazil and Colombia have been unsparing in their assaults on Israeli policy, uh, which obviously makes it difficult for Washington to build bridges to these two South American giants. And of course, one has to wonder if one is in the State Department, is Israel a reliable ally? That is to say, the press has been replete with articles about how Israel has not been cooperating with U.S. imperialism on the Ukraine caper. Articles have been dragged out from past news sources concerning Israel leaking sophisticated U.S. military technology to the People's Republic of China. The fact that before October 7th, Mr. Netanyahu was a regular visitor to Moscow breaking bread with Mr. Putin. So I could go on in this vein, but I guess the question should be, what took the United States so long to abstain after carrying water for so long for Israel at the same time that Israel was putting a thumb in the eye of Uncle Sam? Dr. Horn, the other big story we'd like to get you to com uh, comment on is the, um, the terrorist attack in Moscow. Well, it's understandable why Moscow is pointing fingers of accusation westward. It's not only because of Washington's uh, apparent participation in other like-minded schemes, such as what Seymour Hersh has reported concerning the blowing up of the pipeline from Russia into Germany. But if you look historically, it's obvious that there has been a decided collaboration between the Anglo-American powers and religious zealots against their common foes. 
Indeed, let me point you to the scholarship of Rudolph Ware III of University of California at Santa Barbara, who has pointed out that understandably we point to uh, London when we talk about uh, Israel. That is to say, the Balfour Declaration and the fact that uh, London helped to usher in the Zionist state onto the world stage. But we also should point out that with regard to the rise of the Wahhabi, who still real significant influence in Saudi Arabia, that that too was engineered by London. Uh, recall the film Lawrence of Arabia, which lays out how that fundamentally went down. And you don't have to go back uh, to the early 20th century, uh, fast forward to 1979 to 1989, with the then Soviet Union's intervention in Afghanistan, where the United States collaborated with religious zealots against Moscow, uh, helping to drive out of power a left-wing regime in Kabul, and within Washington paying the price when these so-called allies, these religious zealots, turned on Washington with a vengeance with the bombings of September 11th, 2001. And, of course, we all know that in Syria, for the last decade or so, uh, there has been collaboration between U.S. imperialism and religious zealots in league with Israel, I might say, in terms of dragging into oblivion the uh, al-Assad regime in Damascus. And of course, it took a rescue operation uh, from Moscow and Iran to keep that scheme from taking place. And then, of course, there's Africa. Many of us have been wondering uh, when it's going to be painfully obvious to the corporate media that Washington, in order to get back at the Sahel African states, including Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, will be collaborating with religious zealots in order to wound and weaken those regimes insofar as they turn to Moscow and away from France and France's neo-colonialism. So it's understandable why this attack this past Friday is being viewed with suspicion uh, in Moscow, uh, given the history that I've just laid out. And also what we should be expecting, I'm afraid to say, is the collaboration with these religious zealots with U.S. imperialism, likewise in the People's Republic of China. Really quickly, if you could go back to your Gregory Meeks point and, and, and elaborate a little bit on, are you saying that he's been championing neocon policy or that he has been adversarial to neocon policy? Because I know he's been very, very outspoken and supportive of the Zionist state of Israel. Oh, I'm saying that he supported a Thank you. con policy. Okay. And, okay, fair enough. There we go. Uh, Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, great. We can't give Meeks an out at any time. <laughs> so I wanted to be sure that I wasn't missing something. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Greatly, greatly appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you.